I would be fighting for something else. But my basic objective is to help liberate humankind from oppression and injustice. But the British replied with ruthless repression and firing on unarmed crowds of men and women. Over 90,000 protesters, including Gandhi and other Congress leaders, were imprisoned. The Congress was declared illegal. The years that followed saw numerous rounds of talks between the British and various sections of Indian polity. By 1935, through a Government of India Act, the British planned to involve a section of the country into elected provincial assemblies. Only 14% of the population was allowed to vote and the divide and rule policy was once again evident as an overriding strategy. The elections to the legislative assemblies, organized on the basis of restricted franchise and separate electorates, inevitably produced separatist sentiments. The Muslim League, led by a Bombay-based barrister, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, propagated the theory that Hindus and Muslims were two nations and could therefore never live together. Gandhi and Congress opposed this idea vehemently. To them, secularism had been the linchpin of the freedom movement, and India's secularism had its roots in its civilization. Secularism, you're using it as a word, as a concept, and obviously a modern concept, but this society has basically rested on this kind of a consensus, on mutual adjustment, on mutual accommodation. So secularism was an idea that was, as it were, imposed from the above, but again, it was done so because people were sensitive to the fact that this, this society rests, operates on an inter-community network. Between 1937 and 1939, Congress leaders repeatedly met Jinnah to conciliate him. But Jinnah remained adamant. In 1940, the Muslim League passed a resolution demanding the partition of the country and creation of a state called Pakistan. By 1939, events in faraway countries had begun to find their resonance in India. The Second World War had broken out, and the Indian National Congress leaders were in full sympathy with the victims of the fascist forces. But an enslaved nation could not be drawn into the war. They demanded that India must first be declared free. On the 8th of August 1942, in a historic Congress session, Gandhi told the delegates, do or die, and told the British, quit India. Once again, the British struck back ruthlessly. The entire Congress leadership, including Gandhi, was arrested, and they were to remain imprisoned for the next three years. But the fight was now carried forward in the streets and in the hearts of the average Indian. The freedom struggle had by now created a dominant feeling of oneness, a unity in its diversity. And the entire country, even with its seven major religions and what would eventually become 18 official languages, was looking to the end of colonial rule with a sense of urgency. The story of India's freedom was also of heroes and heroines, many of whom, through their personal sacrifices, were to achieve greatness. If Nehru, Patel and Azad were disciples of Gandhi, there were others who were equally convinced that the British could only be defeated through an armed struggle. 